Yeah, so, well, this is NDC. There are loads of interesting talks out there. So thank you for picking up my session in particular. Um, my goal today is to untraumatize you with Git, because, you know, many of us have suffered a lot with Git. And um, we'll try to transform Git from a set of magic spells into a tool that you can actually control and take advantage of. So just let me put out there, I am no expert. I'm just someone who got fed up with not understanding what the heck is going on and came back to report what I found. So speaking of me, uh, I am Manu Magalhães. I am a DevSecOps developer. I was born in Brazil. That's why I have this also charming accent. And I come from a non-traditional background in tech. As a trained journalist and professional translator, I used to generate new information. But since I learned software development at a free and pretty awesome bootcamp, uh, I instead started protecting information from source to screen at Sky UK. So uh, it wouldn't be surprising if our Git mental model were like this image. Git as a collection of barbed wires, dangerous that are, you know, just something you don't want to touch. Every spike is a commit, every wire is a branch, and guess what? They get entangled by default. Not cool. Better not mess with them or you might bleed to death, right? And it's understandable because most often than not, when we learn Git, people tell us, oh, just type this command and you'll be all right. And also Git is for most people means to an end. You know, you're not there to work with Git, you're there to create software. So Git is just a place where you store your code or something like this. Uh, and also, we generally trust that someone somewhere in Stack Overflow will give us the secret, you know, commands to solve all our problems, right? And then the barbed wires continue in our head. So I would like to propose a mental model that is a bit more accurate and a lot more friendly. Uh, this doesn't seem to be working. So. Okay, so in 2011, uh, the British documentary called Wasteland was shortlisted for the Oscars, and it showed how the Brazilian artist Vic Muniz created a collection called Pictures of Garbage. So Vic Muniz worked in collaboration with garbage pickers in Rio and gave them the profits, well done, uh, to create images on a massive scale using discarded objects like tires, wires, toilet covers, and so on. And the final product was a series of photos taken from above uh, showing the whole picture. You can see there the shed where it happened and the, in the side, uh, one of the final pieces. So, well, this is pretty much how Git works. And that's the mental model that worked for me. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that your code is rubbish, but like the garbage pickers, we are constantly adding, removing, replacing objects that together create this big picture that is then photographed as the masterpiece. And this is Git's secret. Git is a series of snapshots that shows what it, each object looks like at a certain point in time. Okay, let me say that again. Git is a collection of snapshots that shows what an object looks like at a certain point in time, just like this artwork. And this is one of the features that sets Git apart from other version control systems. This mental model also helps to correct a misconception that Git is a version control system that keeps track of your files uh, as if it were some sort of backup, or that Git only tracks dips, um, or, you know, changes to the files. So to make it clear, Git tracks content. If you don't believe me, check the main page. It's right there, the stupid content tracker. And the building blocks of Git, as you can see, are not our files, folder structures, or diffs, but your actual content. But let me show you something first. Yay, how does this help us? Well, this is just my name, Manu, but it's hashed. 
A hash is what happens when you pass um, some data through a formula. And hashes are generally a string of characters. And no matter how big or small the, the input is, hashes that use the same formula will always have the same string length. And hashes are always unique, fast, and secure. If I hadn't told you that this is my name, you would probably never ever guess, because it's virtually impossible to determine what was the input based on the hash value alone. And here's a quick example. We have the word fox with only three characters, and we have a whole sentence below, but both of them generate a string of 40 characters. And if you change the input just a little, you know, we changed over to over, the result is completely different. So, but why are we even bothering about hashes? Because Git owes its life to them. Although hashes are mainly used in a security context, Git depends on hashing to identify object, objects and commits and ensure their integrity. And you see it soon. Right now, let's explore the anatomy of a Git repo. So here I have used the command three, just to list my directi directory in a pretty way. And can you tell me what is my Git repo in this screenshot? Is it wannabe, the last line? Of course not, that's a text file. Is it Spice Girls in red? No, that's the branch name. So, ah, don't be silly. Everyone knows that it's the light blue there, my lyrics, right? No, that is my directory name. So, this was a little gotcha because Git repos are by default hidden. Um, so, let's create a um, Git repo from scratch. And when you run Git init, you create one. And in this folder, countries will just list uh, whatever is in there. And the dash A allows us to see what are the hidden files. So you can see there the dot git, that is the actual git repo. Um, and this is all brand new, we just created it. No files that were added yet. So what do you expect we will find inside the repo if we cd into git and list stuff? Do you think it will be empty or Will it have something on it? Well, let's see. Let's clear this and see what is inside our REPL. And there you go. This is totally not what I was expecting the first time I did this operation. We have three files there in the top in white. We have four folders, the bottom ones in bold blue. And starting with the files, the head file is a bit too important for us to cover right now, so we'll come back to it later. And uh, the file called description is not super important because it's only used by some obscure web interface that Git provides, and I'm yet to find someone who has ever used it. So let's go to config. Uh, the file config has configuration options that are specific to your project. So, for example, if I want to change my username and my email for a particular project, the config file will hold that information. So, uh, let's clear this again. And if I type git config user.name and some random name, I chose Shuri, uh, I can update my name. And if I do the same with user.email and some random email, I believe Shuri is an Avenger, so there we go. So now if we print the config file, we will see, there you go, my name and my email were updated, so for the duration of this project, I am the princess of Wakanda, thank you very much. Uh, and now let's go back to the folders and see what else we have there. We have the hooks folder, uh, it is for hook scripts which we're not covering today, but it's worth mentioning because um, hooks have very interesting use cases. For example, you can prevent people from committing your AWS credentials. You know, if, if the, the code matches the regex, then they are forbid to commit, or you can run linters before committing all this stuff, and this is where they go. 
Uh, and the next directory is the info one. And inside it, there is only one file called exclude. Um, this file works kind of like a git ignore, but it's mainly for things that you want to ignore yourself without imposing it on other people that are sharing your project with you. So git ignore makes everyone ignore certain files and exclude that is inside the info folder makes only you ignore those, pro those uh, files. And next we have the tastier folder of all, which is objects. Uh, this folder is where our content and our commits live. So this project is still brand new and empty. So if we search for regular files in this folder, we will find basically nothing as soon as this is finished. Yeah, there you go, nothing. Um, so let's create a file and explore the repo again. So I created Chile and let's see what happens. Oh, nothing happened. Why? Let's see if git status helps us. Uh, you can see Chile is in red, meaning that it is untracked. Git is paying no attention to your file until you do a git add. And when you do it, and you print, there you go, you now have your object there, whatever it is. But Git will finally pay attention to your file and index with your content. Remember this word index. If you look again, you may recognize that whole number as a hash. There is a slash after the two first letters because Git uses the first two letters as a directory just to speed up uh, data retrieval. And if we go ahead and commit this file, we can check if anything changes in our objects folder. So we commit, and you can see that I'm very slow at typing, <laughs> and we list. But well, we have tripled the number of objects in this folder. Why? We just added a commit. What are those extra objects? So Git has a special command to help us identify what type of objects these hashes represent. The dash T gives us the object type, so we can see now that we have a blob. Uh, we also have a tree. And lastly, we have a commit. So this right there is the beating heart of Git. Every time you Git add, even if it's just a file with a content version two, uh, you're telling Git to store your content as a blob. Blob is just a funny word that was forced into becoming a technical word that means binary large object. Git blobs don't have any metadata like file name, timestamp, or extension type, nothing. A blob is pure content. And once a blob is created, Git compresses it and hashes it. And let's see that happening in the command line. So we will add some content to our file because right now it's empty. Let's add Santiago to Chile for obvious reasons. And when we add, we're telling it that the content needs to be stored. And if we list our objects again, we will see a new one, starting with 7D, which is the second line. And if we print the content for that hash, we will find Santiago as we expect. And you will see that I always miss the dash P, yeah. You will see that there is no indication of where this file belongs or anything else. Because a blob is just content. Uh, so how does Git relate content with file names and folder structures? That's what we see next with trees. What is a tree? A tree is a pointer. A tree will point to your blobs, but how? By storing the blob hashes and holding the respective file names and other information. And because this is Git, guess what? A tree also has its own hash. So let's see that for real by pretty printing our tree in the command line. There we go. Now, okay. So you can see the first, blo the first block there 
it is about permissions. The second one is the, uh, the object type, which is a blob. And the third one is our whole hash. And the fourth block is the file name. So this is what a tree looks like. It gets the metadata for that blob. But what if we have more than one file? What happens to the tree? So we will create two more files and do another git add to generate the blobs. And then we will confirm that the blobs are there. Okay, so let's add all those, these two files and list to see if they are there. Yes, they are. So let's try and print our tree again. And I'm so slow that I can even drink water. Huh? <laughs> okay. So there's still only one blob. Why? Why hasn't it added the new files? Uh, well, Git only generates trees once we run Git commit. And trees also cannot be edited. So every time you do a git commit, you are necessarily creating a new tree. Um, so when we print the tree, let's print it. We will see if our blob got added. So let's go. And there we are. We now have all three files in that tree. But what if we move one of those blobs to a subfolder? We are creating a new directory called Mercosur and we're moving Argentina to it. Uh, so yeah, some geography for you there. And we add, and we added a blob, but we've seen before that this new blob will not be attached to its metadata. In other words, it won't create a tree until we commit. So let's commit and print the new tree. Okay, the new tree is going to be printed in a second. There you go. Can you see the last line there? A tree can not only hold blobs, but also other trees. And this is how Git uh, creates our whole folder structure. One tree that points to another tree and blobs and so on. And as we saw, the job of the tree is just to point to your content while organizing it as well. And remember when we said that Git is a collection of snapshots that shows what each object looks like at a certain point in time? Can you see that taking shape? Uh, the trees take care of the composition of your, of your directory. And even though blobs are the stars of the show because the content actually lives there, the trees are the soul of these mechanics. But we still have one more object that is also generated when you commit, which is a commit. But what is a commit? We've seen that objects are content, trees are pointers, and commits are pointers. A commit is nothing more than a pointer to a particular tree. And what is a commit made of? Let's print a commit and see for ourselves. There we go. So a commit is made basically of five elements. The first one, the tree that holds the whole screenshot together. The second element is a pointer to the parent commit. The third uh, element is the author of the change with a timestamp. In our case, the author and the committer are the same person, but that might not always be the case because you know someone might create a patch and send it via email for someone to actually commit. I don't think this is done anymore, but the possibility is still there. And lastly, we have the commit message. And going back to the idea of the snapshot, every time you commit, you are pulling the trigger of your camera. Git will capture whatever was uh, pushed to your index and generate the tree. Besides, Git also logs metadata about the commit, as we just saw. 
uh, so you can know metadata about what happened to your repo, who did what, so you can blame. No, no, we don't blame people. So in this image here, you can see the third commit in the top. It is linked to every single file in, in this image there. So it's, it shows how the structure, even though the test file was not changed, it's still linked to the third commit. So everything is linked in one tree, and that is where the, the commit points to. Um, so as we continue working, we keep uh, chaining commit object. And although time goes forward, our commits, they point backwards to their parent. And in this example, each commit has only one parent, but commits can have multiple parents if you are doing a merge, for example, of two branches or more. And this is basically how Git works under the hood. And now that we have seen what Git objects are and how they interact with each other, there's a principle that you may have worked out by yourself by now. Git objects are immutable, like hieroglyphs carved in stone. Uh, yeah, we can't understand hieroglyphs, we can't understand commit as well, right? <laughs> so what happens when you find a typo in your commit or a typo in your commit message? I'm sorry to say, but what is done is done, game over, move on. <laughs> the best thing you can do is just correct the typo in your code and do a new commit. And some people may say, oh no, but you can edit, uh, for example, typos in your commit message with amend, right? Well, yes, but no, because that would break the immutability principle. Do you want to see what happens when we do a git amend, commit amend? So we will create a new file and we will on purpose add a typo to the commit message. So we are committing Bolivia and we will add an extra A to it. Oh no, it's Colombia, not Bolivia, yeah. So look at the hash there. Okay, that's the commit hash. And now we are amending, we are removing the typo. And look, we got rid of the typo, but we also have a new hash. So what is actually happening is that you just replaced commit. So you did not edit, you just did a new commit and forgot about the one with the typo. So all this object stuff that we talked about so far happens under the hood. And because we're humans, we also need a way to keep track of our commit. So let's suppose you had this amazing day, you worked on several branches, did all these commits, and then you get a colleague to review your code. And you know, your colleague agrees and she asks you to send the details and you say, oh sure, check out the commit H3LPM, it won't work, right? So we need a human friendly way to manage our work streams. And that's the job of Git references. The most famous reference we have in Git are the branches. Uh, and what are branches? We saw that object is content, Trees are pointers, commits are pointers, and branches are? Come on, you know, pointer. Yeah, well, a branch in Git is simply a movable pointer to a commit. Picture it as a tour guide uh, that moves around the landmarks you want to visit in town. So the tour guide is not the landmark itself. It is just uh, pointing to the landmarks and moving from one to the next. So every time you commit, your branch automatically moves and points to the next, to the most recent commit. And the most famous or infamous branch in Git is called master. Uh, in, I think that it was last year that GitHub and GitLab changed master to main, and Git was also in the process of changing it to main. I'm not sure if they have finished the tests, but it will soon be default for Git as well, main. So this is an excerpt from a, Git, a book called ProGit, and it says, the master branch in Git is not a special branch. It is exactly like any other branch. The only reason nearly every repository has one is that the git init command creates it by default, 
and most people don't bother to change it. So if there's nothing special about main or master, let's call it main, uh, does it mean that even main is just a pointer? Let's see. So let's bring back our REPL and inspect, inspect the REFS folder, which was the last one that we haven't seen yet. You will see that there are some new things there because we now have you know, actual information in the REPL. But if we list the REFS, we won't find the branches folder because they are technically called heads. And right now we only have one branch, which is main. And let's see what main is made of. Let's cut it. And there you go. It's just a hash. And what is this hash about? Let's print it and see. There you go. It's our last commit, Colombia without the typo. So if branches are pointers, what happens when you delete a branch? Again, let's see what happens. We will create a new um, branch called Africa because we only have one branch at the moment. And we will check what is inside heads just to certify that Africa was added there. There we go, we have both. So now we will delete one of the branches and it will be main because we are both, we will delete the most important branch. And oh my God, we deleted main. What now? Don't fret. You see that there is a hash there? Not always lost. We still have the hash, so it means that we can check out that hash and get back to where to what main was. And we check it out. You know, Git will send you all this message crazy, like, oh my god, you are in detached head state. It's fine. It's nothing to worry about by now. We'll cover that later. Uh, but now you can create a new branch from off from this um uh, this checkout that you have. So if we do git uh, switch dash c, we will create a new branch and we call it main again. And okay, let's print again our refs to see if our main got there. There you go. All is good again. Two notes though. Remember that this is here is a local project. It's only mine, so I can do whatever I want and I can delete branch, uh, the main branch, but you shouldn't do this at work. And if you do, it's your responsibility. If they fire you, it's not on me, okay? And another thing, uh, in professional settings, people generally protect the main branch. So even if you tried, you would probably not be able to delete the main branch. But anyway, don't even try, okay? <laughs> this is not safe. Uh, and another word of caution, uh, a commit chain that is not associated to a branch, like what you did or checking out a random hash, uh, it will eventually be deleted by the garbage collection. And there is a default grace period of 90 days before git delete orphan commit. And this grace period is customizable. You can make it different. Uh, but, and if you don't want to wait for git uh, default garbage collection, you can trigger it by using git prone. But remember, you will lose orphaned content. Right, so when you create a new branch, git creates a new reference. So let's suppose you created a new branch called feature, like that, uh, by using the git branch command. Your commit has now two references, as you can see there. So how does Git know which branch you are actually working on? Git uses a second type of reference called head, all caps, head. You know, in Portuguese, when something is very difficult, we call it a beast with seven heads. And unfortunately for us, Git has way more than seven heads. But this uppercase head, for a user perspective, it tames all others. Uh, the uppercase head is simply a pointer to where you are, uh, as it will always move with you. Most of times, uh, your uppercase head will match the branch reference you're working on uh, and works as a snapshot of your last commit on that branch. And when you check out or switch, 
you are moving your head in that direction. So only your head moves. And checkouts don't affect the commit a branch is pointing to, it's only the head. Other things happen as well when you check out, but now we're just looking at the head movement. And if you can check out a branch, you can check out any commit as well. And unless you fell prey to the French Revolution, your head is always attached to you. And it goes anywhere you go. Um, when you check out a random commit, uh, you get a case of detached head. It's quite a dramatic terminology, <laughs> but it only means that your head got detached from a branch. It's still connected to you, but it's not connected to any branch. And this is totally fine as long as you are mindful of that. And Git will also help you remember that with messages in your CLI. Um, but why would this be a problem? Um, remember the garbage collection? If you keep working on a detached head, you know, over time, the contents that you're working on is subject to deletion on garbage collection day. So if you ever detach your head, please ensure that you create a branch out of it. And here we have the proof that references do change unlike objects. So we will print, you know, that file head that we said before. Right now it's pointing to main, but if we check out Africa and print head again, it will point to Africa. So it is a movable reference and that's the proof. The last type of reference are lightweight tags. Tags in general work like frozen branches or like the flag on the moon that will be stuck there and left alone in the code forever without ever moving again. So lightweight tags are quick references with no metadata associated to it. Um, to create one, you just need to run git tag and some name for your, for your tag, and that's it. There's also a second type of uh, tag, that is the annotated tag. It works in the same way as the lightweight tag, but it is in fact a git object. So this means that annotated tags get the full git treatment, you know, they have a checksum, they have author, date, and everything. So for example, if you are tagging a release, it's recommendable to use an annotated tag because then you can know, you know, uh, what, is, what are the features in your, in your release, who did it and what, what not. And one thing to be mindful about tags is that by default, git push, the command git push, doesn't transfer tags to remote servers like GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, whatever. Uh, to do it, you need to run git push origin and the name of your tag, or git push origin dash dash tags that will push all of them at once. And although annotated tags and lightweight tags have a different nature, they are both stored in the same place. They live under the reps folder in your repo on a dedicated subdirectory called tags. And now that we're done with the internal workings of Git, you might have realized that Git is all about your past. Git knows what you did last summer and it's the power of Git. And there are different ways to look at your past. The first one is Git log. Git log works pretty much like this picture here. You have a child, their mother, grandmother, great grandmother, and Git log follows the same logic, like an ancestry list. It goes upstream, checking the parents for a certain commit, and this is what a Git log looks like when you don't add any flag to it. But if you add some flags, you can make it a bit more user-friendly, like this, or like this. And I found out that there is this secret sport of, you know, customizing your Git log. So I'd encourage you to own your Git and come up with what you think is the best version of a Git log. And there is another one, and this is Gold, which is Git ref log. It's another way to look at your history, but this time, instead of calling on your parents, it will look at your own path. It will follow your own head, uppercase hat. Um, ref log can be compared to animal tracks in the snow because it shows where they have been regardless of boundaries. 
So it is basically an ordered list of commit uh, your head has pointed to, or a control Z. It's literally retracing your steps. Ref log can be quite detailed, as you can see there. And it's one of the most life-saving commits in Git, as you can see nearly everything you touched in your REPL. However, uh, note that the ref log is not part of your REPL itself, it's purely local. So when garbage collection happens, you are at risk of losing uh, orphan commits because they will not show there anymore. And to finish the basics you can't miss about Git, we need to cover the three trees of Git as well. You may be familiar with these Git status messages. So the first one in red is when you create an untracked file or you make some edits and doesn't, don't have, uh, and you haven't Git added them yet. The second one is when you did a Git add but did, haven't committed yet. And the last one, you are done and dusted, ready to go home to Netflix, right? So these messages reveal what's happening in the three trees of Git, not the object trees, but Git as a collection of files. So the three trees of Git are composed of head, index, and working directory. We already know what the uppercase head is, so let's talk about the index. We've mentioned the word index a few times already, and some people refer to it as a staging area too. The index is one of the files in your Git repo in the format of a manifest. When you check out a branch, uh, the checkout will populate your index and make your working directory look the same. Um, and the index is what your files look like at the moment of checkout. And as you work and commit your changes, the index gets updated with new versions of your files. And although the Git is, the, the index is in a manifest format, with that command git ls-files-s, you are able to see what your index is made of. And lastly, we have the working directory. Uh, remember in the beginning when I showed you my Spice Girls branch and you know that it was not my Git repo, that was my working uh, tree, that is another name for working directory. So that is what we are talking about. The index and the head store content in a compact way that is not superhuman friendly, but when you check out, uh, Git will give you uh, files that are ready to be edited and are human friendly. So it's all unpacked into your working directory. And have you ever noticed that when you open your project folder, you know, using your Windows Explorer or whatever, uh, sometimes your files have a different content or there are extra files or there are missing files or no files at all. That is why, because whatever is in your working directory is kind of a borrowed file from your index. So when you change your, your branch, you are automatically change what shows in your working directory. And there's more to be said about Git internal workings. And I'd love to cover how to undo things, but we don't have enough time for that. But if you understood well what we have covered so far, you now have enough tools to explore Git by yourself and knowing that you can keep your cool because most of your operations will not be lost. Uh, there are certainly a few risky operations that may lead you to losing content, but you will rarely lose content unintentionally. But I wouldn't untraumatize you if I never mentioned the operations that put you at risk, right? So this is a list of commands that can change whatever you have stored in your git commit. Uh, and there is last column here, wd safe. Uh, it means, is it working directory safe? So if you change whatever is in your past, as long as there is a yet, you're safe. Nothing, you will lose nothing. But you will see that if you run git reset hard or git checkout commit with a path, you are at risk of losing things. And let's explore why. 
Well, first remember that the working directory is the most vulnerable area you have in Git because it is actually the things that you are working on right now that are only saved on your local machine. You know, it's not stored in Git yet until you add and commit. So let's move on and see the difference between a checkout and a reset. So when you check out, the, what you're doing is um, basically moving your head, as we already covered, and you can do this for a single commit. But when you reset, you are moving not only your head, but also the tip of your branch. And that is the danger of it. Because if you see in the second one with the reset, the two last commits, they are kind of left behind. So you might also remember that uh, there are three types of resets, right? Git so uh, reset soft, mixed, which is the default option, and reset hard. The dangerous one is the reset hard because differently to checkout, uh, reset hard will just erase anything you have in your working directory. The checkout will keep your working directory as, as it was, but Reset hard, we'll just not care about it. Just delete everything, and the commits that you had before will be orphaned. So um, if you ever find yourself in a situation that you did a git reset hard, and you are desperate because, oh my god, that commits, those commits were relevant, and I need them back, relax, drink some water, and then run a git ref log. Why? Because if your head at any point have visited those two commits, you can still check, uh, check out them using the hash value. Again, don't trust it because, you know, if there was garbage collection, they might be lost, but it's still your last hope. So fingers crossed it's still there. Anyway, just run your git reset hard when you are absolutely sure that you don't need anything else that is being left behind, okay? And the other operation that can make you lose content is a checkout with a path. And why is that so? When you run a git checkout with a path, you are not moving your head, you're just updating your index. And there is a side effect to that. The index will also update your working directory. This is dangerous because it will wipe out your working directory, but it is very useful when you mess up your file in such a way that you just pray, oh my God, I need to start all over again. So you can run this command and instead of checking out, copying whatever you had before, checking out again and control V, you can just do this. And this is an awesome way to reset the working file that you just messed up. Um, and apart from these two commands, reset hard, and check out with a path, you can be pretty sure that you will not lose content otherwise. Another advantage of knowing the ins and outs of Git is that you have a better appreciation for commit messages. You know, we over time we became so reliant on messages from pull requests or merge requests. And if we need to debug or fix code errors, very few people can actually do a git revert or a git cherry pick because their commits are way too long or they kind of mean nothing. So giving small commits and well detailed will be your friend in the future. You can also change history. Uh, yeah, Marty McFly is not there at random, but it is a bit of a controversial topic and people have very strong opinions about it. But there is one thing that unites all tribes. Don't you dare change history in public branches. It can be a disaster for everyone. And by changing history, I mean, for example, amending your commit messages because of a typo, or reordering commits, or squashing commits, splitting commits, and loads more. So rule of thumb, do whatever you want in your local branch, but once you push it, forget about it. It's public domain now. And by taking ownership of your use of Git, you can reason and even use your intuition to get out of trouble. So let's see what problems we can solve with a simple Git checkout. The main page says, Git checkout, switch branches or restore working tree files. 
So it says I can switch branches. Can I switch to a branch that doesn't exist yet? Yes, you put a dash B and you create a new branch. This is super handy when you are working and out of the blue you realize, oh no, I'm working in main. What do I do now? I don't want to lose my work. You just check out B and all the things that you have in your working directory will be transferred to this new branch and main will be like it was before, as if you never touched it. Um, next, you know, git checkout mentions restore working tree files. Can I restore a file I just ruined since my last commit? Yeah, we saw the git checkout and the pastoral file. Uh, remember, this will wipe out what you have in your working directory, but your, uh, your file will be brand new as you had in your last checkout. But restore is just a copy paste from a certain commit, right? Can I then restore a file from an even older commit in my branch? Yes, you do checkout, use the hash value from in your branch and the path to the file. But if I can restore a, from a commit in my current branch, so this means that I can also do it for any other branch. I can use any hash, right? Yes. Uh, you can check out the good branch name and then the path to the file. And to close, let me share a quote from a book called Death Comes at the End by Agatha Christie. Fear is incomplete knowledge. Um, I hope that you've built up a bit more of your knowledge around Git and that this will help you to conquer your fear. And now that you have the main bricks and you know about them, you know what makes Git, uh, feel free to go on and explore it by yourself, create a, a dummy repo and play around. Feel free because, you know, everything is safe there unless you do this, those two things. And feel free to boldly go where everyone has gone before because Git is all about your past, right? Thank you very much.